Hi, I'm Mark Priestley. After a life spent in the elite environment of the Formula One pit lane learning how to win, this podcast aims to bring that elusive high performance culture into your daily lives. Today we're talking about innovation. Technical innovation is something I believe that the Formula One industry is the very best at. Teams have to innovate simply to survive, and yet to be successful, they have to take that innovation to a whole new level, and we can all learn something from that. Welcome to Pit Lane Life Lessons. Talk about how Formula One teams are so successful. Tiny things, but you only find those tiny things when you look for them. Of course, there's only one winner in every Grand Prix, so for everybody else, you haven't won, so it could be deemed that that's, that's a failure. Hello everybody and welcome back to what is the final episode of Series 1 of Pit Lane Life Lessons, brought to you alongside my partners here, Omela Gato Watches. I'm really pleased to say that the podcast has been growing week on week and that is in no small way thanks to you guys listening and sharing it around, telling people about it. I'd love it if you could continue to do that, thank you. We're 10 episodes down and it has flown by and that's because I've loved doing it. And I'm really pleased to say that uh, so many of you keep sending me messages to say that you've enjoyed it too. It really makes it all worthwhile. The last episode of this series is about innovation. And it's something that I think Formula One is, well, it's synonymous with, isn't it? Most people think of innovation right there alongside Formula One. It's just a, a, an absolute stable part of the industry. And it is. I said in the intro that I believe that Formula One as an industry is the very best. I don't think there's an industry better than Formula One when it comes to technical innovation. And I'm talking about the things that we innovate with, but also the rate at which we innovate. It's relentless. Um, Formula One is innovating, of course, all the time. Every single week we're bringing new technical updates to the cars. We're bringing new little aero pieces, new wings, new floors every single week and in fact even within that we of course on television see those updates every week or every two weeks the innovation is happening every single day the work that goes into that innovation is happening every day back at the factories it's a relentless process that's one of the reasons that i love formula one it's one of the reasons i got involved in formula one in the first place because we kept seeing these innovative new ideas popping up and appearing Cars that would be on the cover of magazines or on the TV would have six wheels on or a giant fan on the back. I mean, they're before my time, but they were so iconic, they lived on. And they still inspired me to think about Formula One in a different way. These incredible ideas that no one had done before. And that, of course, is what innovation is. It's bringing something new, whether it's a method, a process, a product or a service, something that no one has done before. We all have to innovate you know all the time in fact over the past year and a half we have all been forced to innovate more and more and as i touched on in previous episodes those who were able to innovate and innovate more quickly to adapt to a changing world to come up with new solutions to problems that we're now facing are the ones who will come out of this whole period of time more successful and that is exactly the same as formula one we're facing in formula one New challenges all the time. The regulators are constantly changing the rules, trying to peg back the teams. We're seeing it right now. We've got changes to the air, to the cars in 2021 designed to slow them down. And yet a Formula One engineer's job is to make that car go quicker and quicker. And so the engineers will look at that new problem, that new challenge that's been thrust upon them from a regulatory perspective and try and look at it from a different perspective. Try and look at it with a clean sheet of paper and say, how can we innovate with this? How can we look at new solutions to the problems? Can we circumnavigate the rule change that the FIA have put in to try and slow us down? And can we find another way around to get to the same type of result? That's innovation. It's thinking about problems in a way that no one has thought about them before. When I think back to my time in the sports, when I got into to McLaren, you know, it was my, my dream job. I loved every second of being there. Whenever I got a spare moment, which wasn't very often to be fair, but whenever I got a spare moment in the factory, I would try and find my way down to the R&D department. 
I would always go and say hello to the guys. I'd always pop in on tea breaks or lunch breaks. If I was ever over that side of the factory, I'd make a point of going in to see them. And the reason was that it was such a fascinating place, full of innovation. I used to sort of equate it a little bit to Q Branch in James Bond. You know, that's where the amazing inventions used to be created or be tested, developed. It was a little area of the factory where if a designer had a new idea, had a brainwave, you know, had a, a crazy wacky idea, well, it would go into the R&D department to be just that, researched and developed. It would be explored further and they would build a prototype or they would be, I'd, I'd walk in there sometimes and they'd be crash testing a, a completely different shaped nose cone to the one that we were familiar, familiar with. You know, they'd be trying out some new solution that may or may not ever see the light of day on a racing car. One of the, the most memorable visits to the R&D department for me was towards the end of my career where they were figuring out or testing out the F-duct, what became known as the F-duct. A brilliantly simple invention that was, for those who don't know, a simple channel of air running through the chassis of the car which exited through a hole in the cockpit and the driver was able to cover that hole with his knee whilst driving along a straight which would then divert the airflow instead of it coming out of that hole would channel that through a, um, some ducting and it would go out the back of the uh, back of the car and be blown onto the rear wing. Doing that would essentially stall the rear wing, it would reduce drag and increase the top speed. So as the drivers got onto a long straight they would move their knee over this hole and the car would go faster. It was as simple as that. It really was the most basic invention but what a brilliant one and innovative because nobody had done it before. And that is where your biggest advantages come from. When someone's not done something before, if you can get that idea to work, you have an inherent advantage because no one else is doing the same thing. And that is what Formula One is constantly striving for, looking for every single day. I mean, McLaren, it was slightly before my time, but McLaren's third pedal, you know, the torque steer system, you may remember that one, it's an extra brake pedal in the footwell of the cockpit of the car. Again, something that nobody had thought of. And therefore, when we created this idea that an extra brake pedal that could just apply the brakes to one of the rear wheels when going through a corner, that would essentially help the car to turn in and prevent any locking, uh, disc locking, was a brilliantly simple system and gave us a massive advantage. And all right, it got banned in the end, as many of these innovations frustratingly do, but it gave us a huge advantage because somebody had thought differently about a problem. They had innovated and come up with a brand new solution to the challenge that we face. It wasn't a new challenge. You know, Formula One has different ways of innovating. Sometimes we have new problems when regulations change or a tyre changes or the weather changes or whatever. Sometimes we have the same problems that we're constantly looking at all the way through time. How do we make a car go round a, a corner quicker? How do we keep the aero platform more stable? How do we ride bumps better? You know, how do we go faster down a straight and yet have all the downforce we need in the corners? These are constant problems, but then if you innovate around the solutions to those, you perhaps find new advantages. Mercedes DAS system, the dual axis steering system that they had on the car last year in 2020 was a perfect example of that. The problem they were facing wasn't a new one. It's been there for, you know, for all of racing time. It's been a problem of how do you keep tyre temperature up behind things like safety car or, or ahead of a race start? How do you minimise tyre temperature when you need to? How do you increase straight line speed? These were all challenges that everybody's searching for solutions for. And over time, of course, we try all of the regular ways to do that. We improve on them, we, we evolve those solutions around things like suspension geometry, uh, around driving style, around tyre pressures, all sorts of the normal tools that we have in our toolbox to try and attack the problems of these dynamic situations on a racing car. And yet somebody at Mercedes decided to think so far out of the box with this to come up with a, a clean sheet of paper and look at how on earth you might challenge, come up with a solution to this challenge if you had nothing that had gone before, if you didn't have to evolve a, an, an existing solution, but if you could start from scratch, what would you do? 
that came up with dust. It was brilliant. It was simple. It was effective. Um, and everybody hated it because they hadn't thought of it. That's innovation. Nobody had thought of it, so Mercedes were the only ones to have that advantage for that period of time. And another one of these brilliant ideas of, of innovation is around pit stops, when pit stops were again one of these things that had evolved over time. You know, incremental gains, that's something Formula One is very good at. Improving things week on week by a small amount, and over the course of a season, you end up with constant uh, constant improvement and ended up with a significant gain by the end of that season, both with the cars but also with the processes we use and of course in pit stops too. But when we got to a point where refueling was, was leaving the sport and we were going to end up with a situation where only tyre changes mattered in a pit stop, something we hadn't had for quite a long time, we started to look at pit stops at McLaren as, well how, how have we got to where we are today? Why do we do pit stops the way we do them? And the answer to that question was, well, they've, been a, they've become evolved from the pit stops that came before, where refueling was always the limiting factor in terms of the time of a pit stop. And therefore, changing the tyres, it wasn't an afterthought, but it certainly wasn't the most important thing. Because it wasn't the most important thing that was going to delay or quicken your pit stop, because you're always waiting for the fuel to go in. And so when we started to look at how we could change the four wheels and tyres quicker than we were doing it at that time, we had that same thing. We threw everything away. We took a blank sheet of paper and we said, OK, if you had a challenge or a car coming into a pit stop box and you need to get those four wheels and tyres changed as quickly as possible within the regulatory framework that we have, how would we do it? Forget everything that we know about pit stops. How would you do it? And we, kept, we realized, we understood that actually a lot of the things we were doing were simply an evolution of previous pit stops that had been determined by their refueling. And so we got rid of all of that. We started again, we started afresh. We redesigned the equipment, all of it, top to bottom. We redesigned the cars to match that equipment. We looked at the process in every single element of it, in finite detail. We transformed the people, the physical regime that people went through. We went through every single little minute detail and changed it, not just for the sake of changing it, because innovation for the sake of innovation can be massively frustrating. There's uh, somebody that, uh, that I know on the speaker circuit, uh, as I'm on, that always talks about this when we had a solution in offices where we'd pull down a screen for the projector to work on and you'd pull on that little bit of string, you'd pull it down, when you got to the bottom you just let it go and it would stop, it would stop at the height you let it at. And then somebody decided to put a motor in these things and it became immensely frustrating because now what happens is you have to go and you find the controller, which is probably lost somewhere, you have to then press the button, it's frustratingly slow for that projector screen to now drop all the way down to the height you need it to, when actually if you pulled it it would be much quicker. And then, secondly, over time what happens is that projector screen gets down to the height you want it at and at some point it breaks. The technology breaks and then you can no longer retract it. Or worse than that, it's retracted and you can't bring it back down again. That's pointless innovation. That's coming up with a solution that we didn't need a solution for. We didn't have a problem and yet someone decided to try and create a solution for that. That's ridiculous. That's not innovation. That's somebody flexing their muscles saying, I've got a motor, where shall I put it? I'm gonna put it on this really simple solution that someone's already come up with. So <laughs> to get back to pit stops, it's just one of those things that frustrates me. <laughs> Getting back to pit stops, we weren't looking for solutions to problems that weren't there. We were trying to find the very best optimum way, the most efficient way of getting these four wheels and tires changed. And by looking at it with a blank sheet of paper, we actually realized that what we'd been doing before was great, but it wasn't the right solution for this new challenge. This new era of pit stops that was incoming without refueling wasn't going to be the way to get the best out of it. Whereas others didn't take that approach. They just thought we could evolve the current solution. Sometimes you have to go right back to the drawing board with a clean sheet of paper and start again. Question the current solutions that are in place. Ask yourselves questions around why don't, why don't people do things this way? Is there a reason we don't do things in this different way? 
and then challenge those reasons. And that's how innovation happens. It's about challenging the existing norms, thinking outside the box, coming up with brand new ideas, even if they might be wacky and crazy. And this is something that we can all learn from. When I touched on it earlier that we've been going through a very difficult 2020 and 2021, innovation is what gets us through that. I talked in a previous episode about the traveling salesman who maybe used to drive to people's offices or, or factories to sell things, widgets, and how he might now have to innovate because he can no longer do that. He's got to do it virtually online. That's innovation, coming up with new solutions, coming up with a different way to approach the challenge that you have in front of you. And we all have to do this. In fact, we all do do this every single day. We're always innovating. And it might be the most simple things that we don't even register on a personal level, but we're often evolving things. We're often doing things differently to the way things have done before. But often people think they're innovators when they're not, or don't think they're innovators when actually they are. They're innovating all the time. A lot of the companies that I go to and speak to in, my, in the corporate world think they're really innovative. Some of them are. But the problem with innovation in the wider world, so Formula One is great because innovation happens regularly, it happens fast, it's happening all the time, and at an ex, you know, exceedingly extravagant level sometimes. The problem in the corporate world, and when I go and talk to these companies, is yeah, we want to innovate. You know, they say we want to be at the leading edge of innovation. That's what we do. We're companies, an innovative company. But also, you know, we want to be efficient. We want to be the most efficient company in the business to make savings here and there. Innovation and efficiency don't necessarily go well together because the simple process of innovation is a kind of try, try it, fail, try again. It's a, it's a sort of exper process of experimentation. And often that's not cheap. That means throwing money at a problem which may well fail multiple times. The solutions may well not work out. Like the R&D department in McLaren. The amount of noses and, and pieces of bodywork that I've seen crash tested, chassis that I've seen crash tested because they were trying innovative ways of laying up the carbon to save weight or improve strength in different areas. And yet they'd be destroyed over and over again because in doing so, they still have to pass the FIA crash tests. And the only way to know if it's going to pass that crash test is to try making it, make a component, lay the carbon up in this new innovative way, see the benefits from torsional rigidity and those kind of things, and then smash it to pieces. That's not efficient because you're going through those, those processes on a regular basis, just trying to get to a, a level that works. And of course, today we have some far more efficient solutions like CFD, which save some of that efficiency that allow us to test in a virtual world some of these solutions before we have to make them for real. But even so, it's not an efficient process because even if you take away the physical cost, the cost in terms of time of innovation is extreme. It's a trial and error process. And you know, when you're talking about an evolution of a process that's gone before, not necessarily being innovative, but just taking tiny incremental steps, being less brave, taking a little creeper step forward each day, each week, month, year. That's much easier to do in an efficient way because you've got everything you've learned before and you can just creep a little bit further forward with another solution. But that is great. It will keep you moving forward, but it depends on the rate of improvement that you're your, your uh, competitors are doing as to whether that will keep you at the front of the field. Because sometimes you have to innovate to take the giant leap forward that you need. And in the wider world of industry, this dilemma between efficiency and innovation is a big one. It's a real one. It's one of the reasons that the wider world, that industry or the corporate world or, or anywhere outside of Formula One in the most part, struggles to innovate in anywhere like the same way that we do in our sport. So to be that innovative in the wider world, you have to be brave. You have to have a leader in your organization that's willing to commit time and resource, money quite often, to being innovative. It's giving someone the freedom to go away and experiment and think outside the box and try something brand new. 
and the fact that you're breaking new ground, the fact that an innovation by its very definition is something new, something that no one has done before, means that there's a very high chance that on the way to getting that solution, you'll fail many, many times, which can be costly. But if your leaders can have that longer term vision that will allow you to go through that process and get to the big winning moment, the big light bulb moment that might be the thing that sets you apart from the competition, that longer term vision, accepting some of the pain and process to get there in exchange for the big win, that's something that can be incredibly rewarding. And it's also the sort of thing that drives technical innovation, that drives solutions, that brings inventions that can affect and help the wider world. If we didn't have people like that, we would never see any innovations, would we? And this is where I think we can all sort of learn stuff like this from the world of Formula One, because being that innovative, all right, we can't all be that wasteful and that inefficient throughout our lives at work and in our family lives and those kind of things. But we can take some of that mindset that allows us to free up a little bit of our capacity to think a little bit longer term. Of course, we can't all just think way into the distance. We have to think about today, the here and now. We have to keep things on track in our day. But if we can free up a little bit of capacity to start thinking bigger than that, to start thinking about being innovative and thinking outside the box, well, we could all benefit in the same way that wider industry and that Formula One does. We could be innovative in bringing solutions to, to our workplace. If we have an idea that no one's thought of, have we got the freedom to pipe up and, and bring that idea to, to our boss, to our leadership? Or are we terrified that people are going to laugh at us? If innovators over time were all too scared that somebody would laugh at their ideas, we'd never get anywhere. I've talked before about the MP418, a car at McLaren that Adrian Newey uh, led the design on, that was on paper a terrible car. It never even made the race, it never raced once. So many of its solutions were actually disastrous when it came to that moment trying to get them to work. But it was one of, if not the most innovative racing car that I've ever worked on because the solutions were solutions that no one had come up with up until that point. I've talked before about the, the sort of really narrow needle nose, which in fact is what I was talking about when I went into that R&D department. This nose cone that may not look too out of place today because lots of cars are now having very narrow noses, but back then it was crazy. It was, it was a, a wacky idea. This tiny narrow nose cone on the front of the car that brought with it aerodynamic benefits, but how on earth would we get that through the strict FIA crash tests? Well, the only way to do it was to design one, build one and crash test it and then tweak the layup of the carbon fibre and crash test it again and destroy multiple nose cones trying to get towards a solution where that nose cone would eventually pass the test and bring us the benefits we need, which of course we did. It was an inefficient, time consuming process, but it came up with a solution that went on to influence the aerodynamic thinking of many cars that followed it. The exhausts exiting into the diffuser, similar sort of thing, hadn't really been explored fully in Formula One until Adrian Newey did it with that car. We couldn't get it to work and yet years later, everyone's using exhausts that now exit down towards the diffuser. And so innovation has to start somewhere. And actually the innovative process doesn't always develop the solution straight away. It could be that it just kickstarts a process of thinking that further down the line, like with those ideas from the MP418, they then become developed to a point where they, they start to work and bring the benefits. And again, that's something that we can all take stuff from, isn't it? Because by thinking differently, even if we don't find the magic moment right there and then, what we've done is started a thought process that might then lead on to the solution that we need. And it can be literally anything from the way we parent our children to the way we go about operating systems in our house, the way we file our paperwork away, the way we organise the desktop on our computer. 
Now they might not sound groundbreaking, but if you're doing something in a slightly messy, inefficient way, maybe there's a different way that you haven't thought of yet. And why not just give it a go? When the consequences of something like that are clearly not too severe, it might cost you time. It's not gonna cost you lives, it's not gonna cost people's health. So why not try something? Why not experiment with a new solution to that? And I don't know what the answers to those are, but maybe it's about filing your paperwork in, in different places in the house or in different ways in those places to make it easier for you to find it when you need it. Because maybe right now it's a total mess. Now, if you're thinking of something new, if you're thinking of a new way of doing it, it might not work straight away. It might confuse the hell out of you, but somewhere down the line, because you've thought about doing these processes differently, about coming up with new solutions to an existing problem, you may well eventually get there. And that is what innovation is all about. As you know, I've been working with Omologato Watches as a partner on this first series of the Pit Lane Life Lessons podcast. I'm really pleased that I am because not only are they a great company making great watches, and I fully encourage you to go and check out omologatowatches.com at the end of this podcast, but they're innovative. And the reason they're innovative is, is not necessarily in the most obvious way, which is kind of why I like them. The watches, well, they're innovative in their designs. They're all brilliantly, beautifully designed and beautifully made. But look, there are millions of great watch companies out there doing that. What makes Omologato different is partly the way they sell their watches based on a story. It's not just about a beautiful timepiece, which they clearly are, but it's about a story that's attached to them. They have gone about their business by associating watches with moments in time or with places associated to racing. It might be that it's associated to a, a famous livery of a, of a past Formula One car that they have bought the rights to or to a circuit that we all know and love. And those stories are then what sell those watches because when you put one on your wrist, it reminds you of a particular moment, an iconic moment in time. And people like that. And on top of that, the other really innovative thing that Omologato have started doing is when it comes to their sponsorship opportunities. They don't just exchange money for a sticker on the side of a racing car. They go deeper than that. They start to work with drivers. They create opportunities for young drivers to get into go-karting. They're trying to get fully integrated into the motor racing world and the motor racing ladder. They're using their sponsorship for good rather than just exposure. They create events around cars and around motorsport that people who buy one of their watches get involved in the Omologato club, in the Omologato family. And then they get invited to these events where like-minded people wearing these watches and all clearly motorsport fans become part of something bigger. That's innovative. It might not be massively over the top and out there and technical, but it's innovative thinking. And that is one of the reasons that I love them. We can all be more innovative in the way we think. We don't have to be designing racing cars or making products. Innovation comes from just doing something differently. It can be making something or it can be thinking about a problem in a different way. If we can look at one of the problems in our lives and think about a solution that maybe no one else has, that's innovation. And it's easy to sit there and think, well, how am I? I can't do that. I'm not a, a designer. I'm not an inventor. You don't have to be. We all face problems every day. And some of those problems are unique to us. Some of those problems have a, uni a unique twist for us in the way we experience them. And everybody in their own minds is unique anyway. And so we can all look at a problem in a slightly different way. And I was thinking, thinking a while back about some of the problems that I don't think we've yet got proper solutions for. And, you know, I was thinking about ironing. I, I very rarely iron a shirt, but when I have to iron a shirt, I hate the process. And I sort of wish that there was a system that someone had come up with that, that shirts could be self-ironing or a machine that could do it for you without you having to do it. Those are sort of things that take somebody brilliant to have an innovative, an innovative idea that could come up with a new solution. You know, when James Dyson reinvented the vacuum cleaner with this cyclone effect that was, you know, didn't need a bag and was far more efficient. It's because no one really had looked at that problem for a long time. We'd taken a solution and just used it forever. And 
the iron is something similar, isn't it? No one's really ripped apart that process of ironing a shirt for a long, long time to a point where we've found a groundbreaking solution. And there are so many others of these too. There are so many other things that when you drill down deeply, you start to realise, well, this has been the same for all of the time I can remember. No one's really changed or tweaked these designs. A little bit like the way we looked at our pit stops all the way back in the mid 2000s when we started to look at why haven't we adapted? Why haven't we changed our pit stop procedures or our pit stop equipment, our pit stop techniques for so long? Because we've just been tweaking them every single year. And by taking a fresh look, you can come up with innovative solutions. In the education system, we sort of discourage innovation in the most part, don't we? We, we teach our children not to think differently or not to think outside the box because we want them to come up with what we think as a teacher is the right answer. That doesn't promote innovation or innovative thinking. We try and, and pigeonhole all of our students into the same box. We try and squeeze them all into this square shaped hole, even though some of them are not square shaped. And that's just a situation in life. Everybody is different. And that's one of the messages I hope will have come through this entire podcast series as one of the most important things. People are different right across the world. In your family, everybody's different. I've got twins, two twins, completely different people, different personalities, different characters, different strengths and weaknesses. And so they have to be treated on an individual basis if we want to get the best out of them. That can be applied to everybody. People are not all the same and yet our education system tries to do exactly that. They try to force a round peg through a square hole too often and it doesn't work. One of the things that I've done at home to try and encourage my own children to think a little bit more innovatively is we took what was a standard board game, you know, a game like Monopoly for example, and I'd give it to the kids and say, right, let's come up with our own rules. Let's create our own board game. And we took some of our favorite board games and I let, I let them lead this. And we just took a great big sheet of card, we divided it up and they came up with a board game. We call it the Priestly Game. <laughs> Not a very innovative title, but it's a brilliant board game because they created it and it has some of the best elements from all of their favorite board games in there. It has some new elements in there that they just thought up. And it's brilliant. It has a little bit of snakes and ladders in there. It has a little bit of uh, Monopoly, a little bit of the forfeits that come from other games. It has dice, it has cards. It's just a brilliant game. It's one of the favorite games that we now play. And what's best about it is that it's innovative. No one else has a game like this. And it came from some innovative thinking where the kids would been, had been freed up, we'd be given total blank canvas to think up a solution to a problem which was, right, we need a better board game. We've, be, we've grown bored of the games that we currently play. We need a new one. There's your challenge. Go away and think up something completely new. And they loved the process and now we love playing the game. There must be loads more techniques that we can encourage our children to do around a similar sort of way, similar thing. We do it with cooking. We come up with meals that don't have a recipe and not out of a recipe book something that no one's done before by mixing ingredients together and experimenting. And <laughs> we've had some disastrous solutions. <laughs> As I said, not always a, an efficient process because sometimes you get some epic failures on the way to success, but we've had some great things. The most important thing about the process though is that it teaches the children that they don't necessarily have to just always follow a set of instructions. Sometimes they can be free to think about problems in a different way. To think about something without the, without the restrictions of knowing the way people think it should be done. And as children, of course, we have much more scope to do that. And yet the grown-ups in their life tend to restrict them. Children are, are far freer from the, the inherent biases of stuff that's gone before. They don't necessarily know how we think things should be done. And so they can just have the freedom to think about how they think it could be done. So we're innovative, we're innovative people right from day one. It's society that tries to constrain some of that 
and I am now actively trying to undo those restrictions to take those shackles off my kids on some occasions. And if we want to grow a generation of innovative thinkers, these are the kinds of things that I believe we could and should be doing more of. You know, when you think about a toddler learning to walk, a toddler has no perception of how that should be done, how somebody might have done that before them. They're figuring it out as they go. Same thing with, with learning to speak or even the first things they do in life, the sensations that they experience for the very first time. They're not doing that with somebody saying, right, this is how you should be doing that. They're doing it by trial and error. They're experimenting. They try to take a few steps, they fall, and then they get back up again. You know, they are innovative thinkers. If they fall a little bit to the left, then they probably put step a little bit to put their leg out wider to the left to, to balance themselves. It's just a process of figuring it out as you go. And that is what innovation is. Figuring stuff out without the restrictions of having to be restrained by a, a certain framework, a certain set of rules. And I honestly believe that we need more innovative thinkers in the world. Formula One is a great place to look at for inspiration. And I fully appreciate that Formula One is, is not operating on an efficient level that many businesses have to do. Formula One has the financial freedom to be able to throw money at problems at times and experiment until their heart's content in the most part. It's why we're so fast paced. It's why we can develop technologies at such a rapid pace. It's why Formula One is such a hotbed of development and how some of those developments can pass on to the wider world. Formula One so closely associated with the automotive sector and yet they couldn't be more different when it comes to innovation. The automotive world, the road going uh, road cars, is such a slow moving beast. We rarely get innovations coming through the automotive sector because they take so long to implement because of regulations and because of the, the sheer scale of what they're doing. In Formula One, we can try more things over the course of a season. We can experiment more. We can come up with more new ideas than the road car industry comes up with in 20 years because of the pace of development that we operate at. And yes, as I say, it's not always efficient to do that. But we need people that are willing to forego efficiency for the big wins, the big goals that come with innovation. And that is where I think we've got to find as individuals, as families, as, op as companies, we've got to find a better balance. Yes, we need the efficiencies, but we also need to have a mindset that allows us to free some of those people in our organisations up to take those experimental decisions without the fear of them going wrong. Accepting there will be a cost to that, but knowing that in the end there will be a benefit that comes from it that could be such a significant benefit, it could really set us aside from our competition. It's a mindset change more than anything else. Allowing people the freedom to think differently, starting with our own children, is where we're going to end up with a far better, more innovative world in which we can all benefit. I, of course, had one of the best teachers when it came to learning to innovate. Ron Dennis, one of the most brilliant people that I have ever met, certainly ever worked with, one of the best innovators. And this is a guy who's well into the latter stages of his life and yet shows no signs of slowing down when it comes to innovation. Some of the most brilliant ideas that McLaren have been responsible for have come at least in part through Ron Dennis. They may not have always been his ideas, but he's the man who has to sign those things off. When a designer like John Barnard comes to Ron Dennis and says, I've got this amazing idea for creating a new chassis out of a material that no one's done so before, carbon fibre. It's Ron Dennis who has to see that vision, has to buy into it, and ultimately has to approve it, has to approve spending what must have been an incredible sum of money an incredible amount of resource and time and energy into developing a technique in which no one else had dared venture up until that point. 
brilliant innovation. And we know how that McLaren chassis, that carbon fiber monocoque transformed not only McLaren's fortunes, but the entire industry right up until today. We're still using them today. That was a McLaren innovation. And Ron Dennis has been responsible, at least in some way, for so many of these. One that sticks in my mind with a little wry smile, but also with a massive amount of appreciation and acknowledgement of the way Ron saw his vision of the future was first of all when McLaren introduced the McLaren Lab that I've talked about where we began to innovate in the world of human performance over and above the technical performance that us and every other Formula One team was focusing so much attention on. Ron and the team around Ron recognised the possibilities of focusing on human performance, both physical and in a mental sense, and began to exploit that as a potential advantage. It was innovative in our world because no one had done it before. And we started to go away on these team building weeks and these biometric testing programs at the Institute of, uh, of the Finnish Olympic Institute in Finland, in Courtenay. We began to look at mental preparation. We began to look at physical dietary requirements, even mental requirements when it came to things like pit stops. Some things that nobody had ever looked at in that sense before. Massive amounts of innovation. We looked at the impact of body temperature, just like in the way we look at engine temperature and the temperature of the electronic boxes on the car and how when we step outside of a temperature window, just like with the tires on a car, we can start to limit performance. It's the same with the human body. And nobody had really appreciated that from a, a, a team perspective before. But Ron saw that idea. And so we looked at a program of how we could control body temperature to the optimum levels and therefore try to generate the optimum levels of human performance when it came to pit stops. One of those trips down to the R&D department that I touched on earlier on, I remember this with a huge amount of affection. It does put a smile on my face because one day I walked into this department and they were setting up for a big experiment. That experiment, and you'll know this if you've read my book, that experiment was conducting an experiment on a human by rigging that human up with a full pit stop gear set up, the clothing, the fireproof suits, the underwear, the helmets, the gloves that we used to wear for all of our pit stops, and rigging him up with sensors all over his body to measure temperature. They then proceeded to put this poor guy from the marketing department, I think he was, inside the autoclave at McLaren. The autoclave is the giant industrial oven they use to cure carbon fibre components made for the car. <laughs> This poor guy had to go and sit inside the autoclave while they raised the temperature to what they deemed to be acceptably high levels and monitored his vitals whilst he was in there, monitored his temperature. They then took him out and they then redressed him in this innovative new suit that Ron had had developed for us at McLaren using NASA technology. It was a cooling suit. It was a full pit stop outfit that had pipework running all the way around it that circulated cooling fluid around the outside of this suit and therefore lowered the body temperature of the person wearing it, the member of the pit stop crew. So this poor guy from the marketing department had to go through the same process, getting back inside the autoclave and essentially baked <laughs> whilst wearing the new, the new outfit. And we all gathered around to watch this experiment unfold, partly through in part through this disbelief of what we were doing, but with a huge amount of appreciation for what we were trying to achieve, which was breaking new ground in this area of human performance, something that we, as members of that pit stop crew, would likely benefit from in the future. Now, the experiment didn't really work very well. There were a number of complications with the, the actual equipment that we were then went on to, to test in a real world scenario. If you want to know that full story, it's hilarious. You do need to read the full, the full uh, verse in my book. Uh, but it was an idea that was innovative. And like I've described in other stories mentioned earlier in this podcast, not all innovations work out first time. That was an expensive, a costly process that in the end didn't really yield the results that we were hoping for. 
But what it definitely did was trigger a process of thinking, of innovative thinking that led on to other concepts that definitely did work. Other ideas that helped us get the best performance out of those people. And that, of course, is a great result from what started as a little concept, a little innovative idea that somebody had had and then gone to Ron Dennis and convinced him easily as it turned out because Ron was somebody who had such great futuristic vision. So those kind of character traits from Ron were first of all what I loved, what I respected so much and also were what rubbed off on me and that's the very reason that I now allow my kids to go off and create their own board games or to create their own meals without any instructions. I give them that freedom because I was taught in the same way that there was nothing to say an idea was a bad idea. There was nothing to say that we shouldn't be trying something just because it had never been done before. In fact the opposite was true. If no one's done it before maybe that's an even better reason to go and try something different. And that was one of the biggest learnings that I ever took from my time at McLaren, that there were some rules that needed to be adhered to and there were some rules that absolutely should be broken. And only certain people have the freedom or the capacity or the way of thinking to go about freely breaking those rules, even if the result of breaking those rules may not be success first time around. That's what innovation is all about. That's where innovation comes from and that is what I would love to see more of. Now, look, I said this is the last episode of the Pit Lane Life Lessons podcast in series one and it is. And I say that with some sadness because as I touched on in the beginning, I have loved every single moment of doing these and I absolutely am going to do more. As I mentioned in last week's episode, series two, will include guests onto the podcast. There will be a break over the next few weeks while I record the next series, while I start to work out who's going to be on it and how we're going to approach it. But then we will continue. And I promise the break won't be too long. In the next series, I'll be bringing in guests from all across the world of elite motorsport. Some people who are still involved, some who have been involved and moved on to other things. And yet those new things, those new businesses or those new ways of life are heavily influenced, as mine is, because of their time in Formula One. I'm really interested to get to the bottom of some of those stories, some stories that I think you'll find fascinating, some stories you've never heard before from people that you may never have heard of before. Hopefully we'll have some people you definitely do know on there as well, and the mix of that I think should make a great second series, something I'm really, really excited to bring to you. And as I always do before we close out another episode, I really want to bring you a couple of your messages and a question that somebody has left this week that I thought was worthy of sharing with you. First of all, this one from William Prebass, who says, Hi Mark, I've just been listening to your podcast while writing covering letters and adapting my CV, and it's given me the motivation and inspiration to get into the world of F1. You have the inspiration to keep me pushing. Keep the podcast coming and I can't wait to hear the views of other members of other Formula One teams in season two. Uh, thank you very much, William, and I wish you the very best of luck with those letters and CVs. Fingers crossed that one or two of those come back with positive responses. I'm definitely keeping my fingers crossed and rooting for you, mate. Thank you for taking the moment to write me the message to let me know. Uh, this one I love from Steve Williams on YouTube. He says, quality content as always, Elvis perfect mix of sport and business. I find myself taking many of the angles and lessons into my day gig of software team lead. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Again, really appreciate you taking a moment out of your day to write back and let me know. Uh, and this one I really love from Thomas Jones, who says, thanks again, as usual. I loved the do the right things, do the things right quote from last week's episode. He says, I lecture about neuro-based behaviours and steps to behavioural change and growth. I'm going to add that one to my quotes handout and it will go right alongside adversity may build character, but first it reveals existing character and the difference between an amateur and a professional is how you correct, uh, correct mistakes and errors. Well, Thomas, thank you. I love those two. I'll take those and I'll use those if you don't mind. You're welcome to use mine. That's a nice fair exchange. 
Uh, thanks very much for writing in. I appreciate you again taking the time to do that. Over on Instagram, I received a couple of really nice messages this week. Uh, first of all, this one from Rusty33, who says, Hello, Mark. Uh, can I start by saying that the podcasts are incredible? So thanks very much for sharing. We've just had our second baby boy. We had a very challenging time with our first baby boy as he stopped breathing on the first night we got him home. And now we've just been home for three days from the hospital and we've got a huge amount of anxiety. Your podcast is helping me and my incredible and beautiful wife to focus on what we need to know. Uh, well, Rusty, Russ, first of all, huge congratulations to you and to your wife. Uh, that's an amazing achievement in itself. You've just brought life into this world for the second time. There's not many more worthy achievements uh, than that. And what I would say to that is, look, I'm really pleased that the podcast is in some small way helping you, but it's you guys that are doing this. It's you guys that have achieved what you've achieved so far, and it's you guys that will get through this. If I can play some tiny, tiny little part in that, then that's wonderful to hear, and thanks for letting me know. And I wish you both the best of luck, and again, huge congratulations to your growing family. Uh, let's hope the next few days and weeks uh, are smooth and a really, really happy time. So thank you for that one. And then this one is a question that I'd like to finish on. I think it's a really good question and it relates to some of the earlier episodes in the series. So I thought I'd read this one out and answer it as a nice way to round things off. Uh, it comes from Akshay Thakur. Uh, and Akshay says, Hi Mark, great content, loving the Pit Lane Life Lessons podcast. He says, I work for Amazon and I've gone through some really tough times. And although over preparing has paid off a lot of times, on a lot of occasions, I felt like relying on intuition gave me an edge as every leader in my industry is always well prepared. I wanted to know your thoughts on how we can use intuition as an advantage. Uh, that's a really great question, isn't it? Because there's only so much preparation you can do and on certain occasions your intuition is absolutely the thing that sets you aside from somebody else because your intuition is something that's unique to you. The answer to your question that I would give though is that your intuition is based on a huge amount of preparation, either conscious or subconscious. Your intuition comes, it's built from the data the knowledge, the experience that it's gained, that you and your mind has gained throughout your life. The choices, the decisions you've made and knowing whether those choices led to good or bad outcomes and recognising those, both good and bad, knowing what worked in the past and what didn't work and making changes to the things that didn't work and tweaking the things that did to constantly improve them. It's that programme, it's that process that you go through every single day that forms the basis of your intuition. That's the first thing. Secondly, I would argue that preparation can really help your intuition. If you're basing decisions on intuition, you can prepare yourself to make those decisions in the best way possible when that moment comes. And I talked in a previous episode about preparing for the, the big decisions that you have to make, the high pressure moments in life. Sometimes it's difficult to do that because you only face those high pressure moments when they come along. Trying to recreate them artificially doesn't give you the same level of pressure than the real life moment gives you when that is unexpectedly placed upon you. But what you can do is prepare yourself by taking the smaller moments in life. The moments when somebody cuts you up at the traffic lights when you're driving your car. Something that's really frustrating, something that's easy to get angry at and make a rash decision that might lead to a poor outcome. In those little moments, those daily moments that crop up all the time, if you can start to train yourself to take a deep breath, to count to three before you decide what you're gonna do, how you're gonna respond, rather than shouting and jumping on the horn, which serves no real benefit to you. If you can start to train yourself to just take a moment to catch your breath, to think clearly and calmly about what your response is gonna be like in those moments. And those moments happen all the time to us. Most of the time we don't even think about them or consciously recognize them, but they're there. And if we can start to use those as a training regime, just to get better at dealing with pressure, even if it might only be low pressure, when the big pressure moments come, when the moments come along 
where you feel like you've got to start relying on intuition or your intuition could give you an advantage over somebody else. The more prepared you are for those kind of situations, the better your intuition, intuition will be in leading you down the right path, leading you to the right decision. People who can't prepare or don't prepare for those moments may well have a more random intuition, may well have a less well-prepared intuition to rely on. So whilst it may well seem that intuition is something that's spur of the moment and random, I would argue that preparation can absolutely be the key to having a better intuition that may well lead to those moments working out in your favour. But thank you so much for the question and I hope that helps you in some small way. Um, that really is it, guys. That really is the end of season one. And as I said a moment ago, it's been an absolute joy. And the very best part of all of it is the interaction that I've had with you guys. This is different to anything I've done before. With a YouTube video that I make on a, an almost daily basis over the last few years, you get instant feedback. With social media, I get instant feedback. But a podcast is something much bigger. It's something that you guys need to commit an awful lot more of your time to. And I am hugely appreciative that you do that. And that you've then taken the time off the back of listening to me for an hour, taking the time to then respond and give me your thoughts and tell me how it's helped you through your day or through your life. It means the world to me. I'd love it if you keep it coming. And the one thing that I would ask of you in this gap before we embark on the next stage of this with season two, is to please tell a friend, tell somebody, share this podcast on your social channels. I would love it if we can grow this into something bigger than it already is. I'm massively appreciative of all of you that have taken the time to watch, download, listen, and share it already, or leave me a review in the podcast store, something that's hugely important if we're able to grow this podcast further. Um, but anybody you can pass this on to, somebody who maybe hasn't discovered it yet, somebody who may not even necessarily be a Formula One fan, but yet could benefit from the messages and the lessons that I've learned through my time in the sport that I'm passing on to you. I want to say a, a massive, massive thank you to Omolagato Watches, who've really helped me to be able to do this. And as I've touched on many, many times, I couldn't think of a better partner to be sharing this journey with because of their values tying in so closely to the lessons that I'm imparting through all of series one. So please do take a moment now to go and visit omelagatowatches.com. Maybe just drop them a message or drop me a message to tell me what you find, what you think of what you see when you get there, because I am almost convinced that if you are a motorsport fan, if you can appreciate good design, and as I said earlier, some innovative thinking around the way these watches are marketed and the deals that the company does behind the scenes, then I think you will really enjoy being part of the Omologato family. So thank you to them. Thank you to you. Have a great couple of weeks, guys, and I'll be back very soon with season two. Thanks very much for listening.